Hello, I'm Veronica Dudo. Warren County has agreed to pay $2 million to two men who say they were sexually abused by the late Sheriff Edward Bullock when they were teenagers. The men say the assaults took place during the late 1970s and 1980s. A man is dead after getting hit by a pickup truck in Old Bridge. 62-year-old Charles Brettweiser was hit near White Oak Lane while trying to cross Route 516. He died at an area hospital. Police say the incident was not a hit and run. An Old Bridge K-9 is being recognized as a hero for tracking down two burglars after they broke into a woman's home. In his first official assignment, Zeus was able to track them down within 15 minutes. Both suspects surrendered and were taken into custody. Rutgers University Dance Marathon raised over $560,000 for the Embrace Kids Foundation during an event at Jersey Mike's Arena. The money will go towards the non-medical needs of sick children. The marathon is the largest student-run charity in New Jersey. Hello and welcome to the New Jersey Morning Show. I'm Cara DeFalco. And I'm Mike Favetta. We have a big show today. And Cara, what a week it's been. From earthquakes, all the aftershocks this week, and eclipse on Monday. And get this, a meteor last night in some parts of central and southern New Jersey. Yeah, yeah. I think, um, what? how many plagues were there? I think we've got most of them <laughs> down at this point, right? We've covered a good point. <laughs> I know. And with the earthquake happening on Friday morning, so many thought, oh, with the eclipse coming on Monday, is this the rapture? Is this right. you know, scripture? And, the, and, and here we go now with the meteor uh, last night. Certainly something else to talk about. So something else to we talk will about. Have, yeah, we'll have details on all those things, including uh, what is going on uh, <laughs> celestially and, and happening here uh, with all these things. Do you have and an we'll explanation for this? Because I'm yeah. at this point. the. <laughs> A lot of this is coincidence, I have to say, because with uh, so many of these events happening in short succession, it has many people wondering what is going on. Yeah. Uh, the cicadas are coming this summer, though. I was that just going to say the cicadas is another thing, too. I'm like, <laughs> all right, we got insects now. Just I really but I'm just waiting for the aliens to land at this point. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure. Um, but we have we have so much more. And we also want to talk a little more about politics because we have the election year happening. So with all of that, we're going to talk politics this morning with Laura Jones. She is host of On New Jersey's New Jersey Politics. Laura, welcome. 
Hey, it's good to see you both. There's always something in New Jersey rocking the political world. Well, and I was going to say, I mean, if if a, an earthquake, a meteor, and an eclipse were not enough, there's always New Jersey politics to get everybody worried about the end of days. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, you know it. You know it. Yeah, Absolutely. So, Laura, we've got the race for governor underway. And while that election isn't even until November of 2025, there's already candidates in the race on both sides. And today we're going to be able to talk to two of those candidates that are seeking the Republican nomination. Senator John Bramanick is, going to, is standing by. But first, the candidate who was the Republican nominee in the last election uh, for governor and almost defeated Governor Phil Murphy. We are welcoming Jack Tutorelli to the morning show. Good morning, Jack. Thanks for joining us. Good morning, guys. Thanks for having me. We're, we're always happy to have you on the show. You've always given us plenty of your time and been very generous. So thank you again. Thank you. Yeah, uh, uh, Jack Generally, it is really, really good to see you. So to give the viewers some context, just so they know, to recap, this is your third time. So I guess the question is, the third time is a charm. The first time you ran for governor was in 2017. You lost in the primary to Kim Godano, who was a former lieutenant governor. Last time around in 2021, you came really close to defeating Phil Murphy in a race that people thought the Democrats were going to really have a much larger margin of victory. So I want to ask you a third time, what are going to be some of the key differences between your platform this time around and previous runs for governor? Well, the biggest difference is the landscape. There's no pandemic to deal with this time. Very hard to campaign when there's a shelter in place order. We lost by a couple of points. Uh, I think we have what it takes to deliver a victory this time around. We're going to talk about the same issues because Phil Murphy hasn't solved them. We still have the worst property tax in the nation. It's still the worst state in the country in which to do business. It's a state impossible to retire in. And uh, despite pockets of success across New Jersey, our school system is failing our children. We've got too many children that are ill-prepared for the workforce if they're not going to college. Um, many people are graduating, kids rather, are graduating without basic skills. Four out of five are not on grade level in our major city, Newark. There's a lot of work to be done, and I'm anxious to get it done. So those are the messages we'll be talking about all throughout the campaign. So there have been so many different messages that you've been sharing and the, you know, the Republican candidate obviously has to take some of these head on. What do you see as the biggest issues that the next governor needs to take on for the people of New Jersey? Certainly property taxes. That issue does not go away. And uh, what the Democrats have continued to do in Trent is just pile the next gimmick or rebate program on top of the last one. Homestead property tax program, senior freeze, anchor, stay New Jersey. Uh, we need something that's easy to execute, is fair, and really, really solves the property tax crisis. And what I'm proposing is nobody should pay more than 1% of the assessed value of their home. And everyone, once they hit age 70, should have their property taxes frozen for life. That's real and permanent property tax reform. No gimmicks. Yeah, uh, uh, Jack, I want to ask you a little bit about your speech. Um, you were very, very passionate about it, and uh, you kind of called out some of your uh, your opponent. Um, so I want to talk to you a little bit about, about that um, and how you plan to appeal to independent, moderate voters. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? You know, I've been on the November ballot eight times. I've won seven of those races, and I've done so because I've been able to bring people together by talking about the issues that matter, I'm not an ideologue. And um, we need a candidate, a Republican candidate, who can unite our party, not one who calls moderate Republicans rhinos or Trump supporters crazies. And uh, we also need a candidate that can convince Democrats to support our ideas. And uh, we also need someone that can convince unaffiliated independent voters to vote for us. I've always been able to do that in my races, and I look forward to doing it this time around. But more than anything, we've got to unite the Republican Party. We're outnumbered by one million. So anyone who's calling moderate Republicans rhinos or Trump supporters crazies is not going to unite our party. And if our party is not united, we're not going to win. Jack, and I, I love that, um, you know some of the things that you were just saying about you know uniting the Republican Party, speaking to independents, speaking to Democrats. Um, it almost seems like these days, you know, compromise is a dirty word in politics that, you know, if you're not wagging your finger at somebody, you're doing it wrong. And you're talking about not only bringing the Republican Party together, but bringing in independents, bringing in Democrats. What sort of messaging or how do you how do you plan to approach these folks that are, you know, a lot of them adamantly against something like that and say, hey, no, the only way we win is together. Hey, go out and talk about the issues that matter, property taxes, doing business on Main Street, keeping the community safe, 
quality schools. Those are the issues that matter most to most New Jerseyans. And that's always delivered victories for me in districts, in a county, in a town where Democrats outnumbered Republicans, sometimes by a lot. But yet I won those races and we came close to winning a couple of years ago. We don't have to deal with the pandemic this time around. Again, I believe we can pick up those extra couple of points that will deliver a win by talking about those kitchen table issues and offering specific solutions. We don't need a celebrity. Um, and uh, what we need really is a chief executive officer, a hands-on chief executive officer to run the state of New Jersey and focus on what's most important to New Jerseyans. And also importantly, someone that's not using New Jersey as a stepping stone. As I made clear the other night, I don't want to be congressman. I don't want to be U.S. senator. Don't want to be president, and I don't want to write a book. I just want to focus on fixing the state we all love here in New Jersey. Uh, so what, one other question I have for you. This is going to be an open primary, meaning you don't have an incumbent running. Phil Murphy has two terms. He will not be running again. So you have, again, on the Republican side, on the Democratic side, an open primary, no power of incumbency. So can you talk just a little bit on the Republican side? We know that John Bramnick, state senator, has announced he's going to be running. Not sure about Bill Spadia, a radio show host on New Jersey 101.5. He's certainly indicated and hinted uh, quite quite adamantly about that. But how do you get through that Republican primary um, and w without battering and bloodying each other up so you have a real chance once it comes to November. New Jersey, again, a, a little bit more of a blue state, but we've just had two years, uh, two terms of a Democrat in office. And what Republicans talk a lot about in the legislature is the one, a one party system because they have control of the Senate, the Assembly, the governor's office. So how do you run your campaign without tearing the Republican Party apart? You know, a couple of things. First of all, competition makes us better. So I welcome anyone and everyone into the race. I am more than happy to have to go out and earn the nomination. But if you do earn the nomination, you have the privilege of being the nominee, you have an obligation to everybody down ballot. So one thing I'm going to make clear as the nominee, just like last time, is that I'll be campaigning in all 40 legislative districts trying to deliver Republican victories. I mean, that's my obligation as Republican nominee. And by the way, when I was on the ticket in 2021, we had our most successful night in 30 years, including picking up seven seats in the state legislature and uh, beating the longest sitting state Senate president in the country. So I do have coattails. Uh, name ID factors in a lot with these things. And having run for statewide office before, I'm very, very pleased with where my name ID is, but we've got more work to do and I'm happy to do it. Uh, I'm not gonna speak to my competitors directly, what I will offer is constructive criticisms on whatever their policy positions are or the approach that they're taking. And one thing I'll say about my two competitors is that we have to unite our party. Sorry to be repetitive, but again, calling moderate Republicans rhinos and calling Trump supporters crazies is not going to work in terms of unifying our party. Jack Torelli, Republican uh, candidate for, primary candidate for governor. We thank you so much for joining us this morning. We really appreciate your time uh, and, and hearing your position on a lot of things. So thank you again. Thank you, guys. Always happy to have you. All right, guys. Well, up next, we are going to be joined by Senator John Bramnick. He's also running for the Republican nomination for governor. And we will talk to him about his campaign and vision for New Jersey. Plus, Joey Fox, reporter from the New Jersey Globe, is here to help break down the race for governor. And later, we'll meet a Parkinson's patient who is just at Yankee Stadium. Wait until you hear what she had the opportunity to do in front of the crowd. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to the New Jersey Morning Show. I'm Cara DeFalco. And I'm Mike Favetta. We're so glad you could join us today. We have Laura Jones with us, and we are talking to Republican candidates for governor this morning, Cara. Yes, absolutely. So we just heard from Jack Cittarelli, and now let's welcome Republican candidate who is currently serving in the state Senate, Senator John Bramnick. Welcome to the morning show. Good to be with you, Laura. Well, uh, Senator, it is so good to see you. You were the first Republican candidate to declare that you were going to run. There had always been talk that Jack Cittarelli, who actually served in the assembly, was going to run for a third time. And also talk that Bill Spadia is going to run, although he has not announced. So I just want to ask you why you decided that you were going to get in and run. Well, we have one party rule in Trenton. And the reason we have one party rule is because the Republicans aren't winning. And the reason they're not winning is because our brand is in bad shape. So I run in a district that has 7,000 more Democrats. Actually, about 75% of the district is unaffiliated and Democrats. And I win. And here's why. Uh, we should never be the party of Donald Trump. Uh, we as a Republican party should be the party of traditional Republican values, lower taxes, uh, law and order and smaller government. But what's happened is uh, the Republican brand now is Donald Trump. And in New Jersey, there's no doubt it doesn't work. And I'm not a supporter of Donald Trump because I watch what he did on January 6th. I watch what he did when he denied that uh, the election results. So, it, my opponents, they want to pledge their allegiance to Donald Trump. And in a general election, to me, that's the wrong way to go. We are a party of Ronald Reagan, of the two Bush presidents. We're not the party of one man. We're not a cult. And consequently, I've been able to win. These other candidates talk about winning, but they lose. And I'm convinced I can win the general election without any doubt whatsoever. Why? because people want change, but they don't want the Trump change. They want the traditional Republican change. So Senator, so you're talking about the traditional Republican change, then what, is, what do you see as the biggest issues that the next governor of New Jersey needs to tackle in order to be successful here and keep their promises to the people? Well, first we have to win, because <laughs> regardless of my positions, okay, if you lose, the Democrats go farther to the left. But let me, I, I sat as Republican leader for 10 years and I sat with Chris Christie and many governors. And when you have some power, you can negotiate. For example, the Democrats want certain things. They don't want lower taxes. I can tell you that because they doubled a budget since Bill Murphy's been there. But I can sit across as a governor and say, OK, what do you need? Because the Democrats are still going to be control of the Senate, at least when I'm the governor. You sit there and you go, look. I want a reduction in the state income tax, or I want to change property taxes this way. What do you need? And then that's how things get done. You know, they criticize me because I meet with Governor Murphy or I meet with Democrats. Well, I think some of these people forgot who was in charge, right? And we keep losing because we come across like we know everything. Well, we might. Unfortunately, though, you might know everything, My all my opponents, but you keep losing. Keep losing, no change. With me, I've proved I can win. Simple as that. Yeah, and Senator, this is what Jack Chitterelli called you out on, more or less, not by name, but in, in his announcement that he's running for governor, uh, that it's not helpful when you have people like you who are calling uh, Trump supporters crazies. And he was critical of a candidate that would be friends and have a hot dog hamburger with Democrats. Then you fired back, though. Well, let me make it clear. Uh, if we don't support the courts, there were 60 decisions of federal courts that said Joe Biden won the election. And then this president, Trump, goes out and, and stirs up the crowd and says, I'm not following, I'm not following the courts. Well, let me tell you how dangerous that is. If you don't follow the courts, then we have chaos in our country. So either Either you support the courts and the judicial system or you don't. This is not this is not an option. And I have to tell you, I'm strongly, strongly in favor of supporting our institutions and our courts. And let me be honest with you. 
I'm going to be clear about that. And if you even the vice president of the United States, Pence, would not endorse Donald Trump. I think that tells you something. He was in that White House for a long time, right next to the man. Yeah, Senator, you mentioned a good point, how so many Republicans are distancing themselves from that instance. But how do you win over independents and get your message across to the Democrats? Independents are dying for a change. I can tell you, moderate Republic, moderate Democrats would like a Republican governor because they see their party swaying way to the left. I can tell you, I've had so many moderate Democrats come up and say, hey, John, you know, something to be honest with you, I, I'd like to see two parties down there because they're caught in that situation. I've been winning independence for years. What independents want is they want somebody from the Republican Party who sounds as if he will stand up for the Constitution and call out Republicans who don't. And I'm going to do that. And I, I understand the risk in a primary. But our country and our democracy is more important than one primary in New Jersey. Senator, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate you being on the morning show with us. Thank you. All right. Well, Laura, we have so many Democratic candidates on the show and we've invited more. So our team and you are working to set those up and we'll bring them to you in a later show. Oh, yeah. Yep. We always uh, have that open invitation to all those uh, running. And again, in New Jersey, it always seems there's just it's a perennial. Right. We're still in the race for U.S. Senate. But again, talking about 2025, that's the nature of New Jersey politics and also the nature of these candidates have to get out there early. Yeah, they yeah, really do. They really do, Laura. And so, so we've just heard from the two uh, Republican primary nominees for Governor Jack Cittarelli and Senator, Senator John Bramanick. Uh, joining us now to discuss the race on both sides is Joey Fox, a reporter for the New Jersey Globe. Hey, good morning, Joey. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Our pleasure. So, so Joey, um, I'm not sure how much of that you were able to hear, but what was your takeaway from uh, the candidates this morning and things that they've said previously? I mean, I think that <clears throat> you saw the fault lines already developing in this race, even though you didn't see the two candidates directly go head to head at each other. You know, they're, they're clearly talking, they're clearly talking about this race in a way that acknowledges the other's existence. You know, you've got John Bramnick who is very clearly staking out this. I am, I am the true sort of avatar of the, the old Republican party. I don't support Trump. I support the type of moderate Republicans who used to win in New Jersey, like Chris Christie, like Christine Todd Whitman. Um, you've got Jack Chitterelli, who is his sort of, He's trying to thread the needle and become uh, become a candidate for for all sides where, you know, he was never a super ardent Trump supporter, but he's also not someone who makes a big brand out of opposing Trump. And he's actually endorsed Trump for president this year. Um, and then you've got the specter of a potential third candidate. You guys mentioned Bill Spadia, um, former state senator Ed Durr has also you know not ruled out a potential run. There are other candidates who might be looking <clears throat> to occupy the fully sort of conservative pro Trump lane. Um, and, you know, ultimately this will eventually go to a general election with one of them being the Republican nominee, but the slog over the next year and two months is to convince Republican primary voters that their vision for the Republican party, which you can already see just how different those visions are, is the one that will A, best represent those voters and B, give them the best shot of winning in November. Yeah. And Joey, listen, these candidates are already taking uh, shots at each other, for lack of a better word. Jack Cittarelli in his announcement. You had John Bramnick firing back. Um, and even on the radio this morning, Bill Spady was talking about Jack Cittarelli. In order to win and for them to have a really good chance at winning in November, you've got to win that Republican primary. How bloody, how bad, how nasty do you think that this is going to get? Um, because you have, you know, John Bramnick, who's trying to be more moderate, Bill Spady, a little bit more conservative and Jack Chitterelli, the candidate that has won for a third time. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this is oh, sorry. Yeah, I think this nope. is definitely going to be a um, a race that uh, is it, not all the candidates are going to like each other. Um, this is not a race where y you have, you know, a, a ton of congeniality necessarily right out the bat. Um, and I think, I mean, it sort of gets back to the point that I was making before where there are the, the 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 main declared or prospective candidates have really laid out some pretty distinct lanes and as you fight over those lanes for the next year that is inevitably going to get to be um to, to start to be a kind of nasty race i think a big question is how much money ends up getting thrown into the race are they spending money on tv ads calling the others a rhino or a pro-trump crazy or whatever what have you 
Um, but I think, I mean, you can see from, from just the way that their campaigns have already started, that these are people who have significant disagreements. This is not just a personality contest. This is a policy contest. This is a contest that has national reverberations with the presidential race. And the candidates are, are going to keep emphasizing that. And it's going to keep on being, I think, a bit ugly. Yeah, Joey, I don't think anyone ever thinks of the gubernatorial candidate race to everyone holds hands and sings kumbaya. It's not that type. But there are some very, very distinct differences. And uh, that could come out, especially in the public view. So when it comes to issues, what do you think will be the biggest factor that will impact the Republicans running for governor? I mean, that's a good question that I don't think we have a super, a super clear answer to yet, in part because a lot of the sort of nuts and bolts issues that I think all these candidates are going to want to focus on they probably agree for the most part. You know, you you, you saw both um, Senator Bramnick and and Jack Cittarelli mention property taxes as sort of their number one issue. That is a classic number one issue for pretty much everyone, every Republican running in New Jersey and some Democrats. Um, and you know, you might see some differences. They might roll out separate policy plans that will that would tackle the issue in different ways. But I think on a lot of those issues where you know it's directly in response to what Democrats in Trenton have been doing, what Phil Murphy has been doing. You might not see a ton of daylight between the candidates because they can all easily declare their opposition. I don't like the way the Democrats have done property taxes. I don't like the way the Democrats have rhetoric around the police. I don't like this. I don't like that. Um, so I think that we'll have to wait and see whether the candidates really try to differentiate among their stances or whether they're all content with saying, you know, the state of New Jersey is, is not in a good place right now. And here are the specific reasons why. Mm. Joey, we thank you so much for your insight and your time this morning. We really appreciate it. And guys, you can check out Joey's reporting on njglobe.com. Thanks again. And Laura Jones, of course, uh, our own Laura Jones on New Jersey's NJ Politics. Uh, she'll keep everybody up to date on everything that is going on in New Jersey politics. And woo, it's already getting spicy out there. Yes, it is. <laughs> so, Mike. The other story, the big story this week that everyone has been talking about and is still talking about, the 4.8 magnitude earthquake that shook New Jersey earlier this week. We have had a bunch of aftershocks. In fact, we just had a 2.6 magnitude aftershock uh, yesterday, the other day, and there are a lot of people still rattled by all of this. So get this, there have been more than 47 wow. aftershocks in the vicinity. Yeah. Now, some of them are too small for them to be felt or, or even heard. Uh, they just are picked up by those seismometers in the area. But still, to have that many aftershocks is something pretty impressive. There's also been some reporting, and this is something kind of new to me since we don't get these large earthquakes here <laughs> very often. Uh, it's a once in a every other lifetime kind of event to have this magnitude. But there's something known as a, if there's a larger earthquake that were to happen, that would become the main shock. And then all of the earthquakes that we've had previously from that point, the 47, for instance, would become four shocks. And then you have aftershocks beyond that. So a little geology lesson to kind of give you a refresher. So much going on. Oh, my goodness. And it's, you know, I we don't think because it doesn't happen often here, we don't think of New Jersey as being on a fault line. But it is. There is a small fault that runs through the state. There are, and there are several smaller faults, but, you know, to see them go back in history uh, to the 1700s, at least recorded history, of the estimation of how strong they were, because, you know, the area settled back in the, uh, the 15th, 16th century. Yeah, right. we have some historically written records, uh, nothing that can be measured on a standard scale, but still uh, quite interesting. So we have to find out where were you on Friday at around 1030 in the morning, Kara? I, you know what? I was driving, actually. So I didn't feel anything at all. Okay. I happened to be home. I was uh, washing my face and kind of disoriented, you know, with the soap in my eyes. And yes. I hear my wife screaming from the other room, shaking, shaking. I'm like, <laughs> oh, they're it's the landscapers. It's been raining for seven days. So they're probably here on a Friday. Uh, and no, in fact, uh, yeah, but the dog slept right through it. Go figure. There you go. There you go. Mm-hmm. So really, really incredible stuff. So we will have more on our weather segment about the variation and where these locations were of all of these aftershocks uh, coming up a little later on in the show. But Kara, up next, it's why, we can answer this question, why it's going to cost you more to ride New Jersey Transit. Yeah, plus why we can't get a break in our commuting costs and how it's getting more expensive to travel into New York City.
Welcome back. I'm Mike Favetta here with Cara DeFalco. You're watching the New Jersey Morning Show. The New Jersey Transit Board of Directors just approved a 15% fare hike, the first in nearly a decade. The approval comes after hearing an hour of testimony from the public and protests from outside the NJ Transit offices in Newark, including Hoboken Mayor Robbie Bala, who gave the board his personal cell phone to try and spark more conversation around the fair hikes. Please write that down. That's my personal cell phone number. I talked to my parents on this phone number today. It's the only phone I have. If you are not a rubber stamp of the governor's policy, call me and tell me why not. But if you vote for this fare increase because Trenton wants it, then I don't see it any other way because what's happening here right now, and you see the people in this audience, what they want is not a fair increase. They want fairness. Is there anything wrong with fairness? I, you know what? He, I, I think it's interesting that he gave folks his personal cell phone number. That's a bold move for any politician, especially <laughs> these days. But, I, I mean, we're we're looking at... Uh, you know, just just inflation across the board. Gas is getting more expensive. We're about to go into the summer gas prices. Um, you know, now NJ Transit's raising the rates. I, I don't know. I don't know how much more people can take before something else gives. And Kara, I think that just goes to show what the mayor did is how the level of frustration that the people of New Jersey are, are at, mm -hmm. especially given how the service uh, leaves much to be desired with the quality of the service. And then to throw on a fair hike on top of that really puts people out of their mind uh, when you want to ask for more money. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if, I'm sorry if we can just bring our prompter back and we'll bring in our next guest that's also around this. So mass transit, again, as we've been talking about, getting more expensive. And as we just mentioned, so is driving. So despite the pushback, it looks like congestion pricing also officially coming to New York City with New Jersey drivers bearing the brunt of it. So what will the new traffic pattern look like as we attempt to avoid the extra charge heading into the city? Joining us today with his take is David DeHarney, president and COO of Artificial Intelligence Roadway Technology Company, Recall systems. David, welcome. Good morning. Good to be here. Thanks for joining us. So David, what does this artificial intelligence roadway technology do and how can it help? Well, you know, I'll tell you, the, the roadways across the nation are in serious um, trouble. Um, a lot of people don't realize this, but they're rated on a report card of about a C minus today. And if your child came home with a C minus, you'd have a, a different conversation. And that is the state of our roadways today. And the tools that are deployed today, they've really been out there since the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So they're kind of old technology. So what's new is that technology has really come to the forefront. AI is a flavor of technology that, that helps identify everything and anything that's interacting in, on, or around roadways. So AI really becomes a tool to help agencies do the job that they're supposed to do, which is manage our roadways. Now, do, do you think that traffic patterns are going to start changing once this congestion pricing is implemented? I mean, I, that's the purpose of it, so I imagine they will. But, you know, what do you anticipate happening? Um, I would say absolutely 100 <laughs> percent. As a, a new long term New Jersey resident who commutes from Essex County into the city. Absolutely. Um, and in fact, it's going to hit more of a, a lower income people, I think, harder because mm -hmm. that's oftentimes they're going to feel the brunt of it the most and they're going to avoid the traffic. So while you might solve this area in downtown Manhattan and make it safer and, and smarter and greener, which is all good, but it's a ripple effect and it will affect everybody that's coming into the city, which is a lot of us in New Jersey making that commute. And so it will change traffic patterns. You'll, you'll go GW Bridge. You won't go Lincoln. You won't go Holland. You won't go it'll just change the, the neighborhoods, the traffic, uh, the parking situation in and around that perimeter. We're just not equipped to do that in the existing roadways that, again, were built in the 50s and 60s. They just have not seen the kind of impact that they're going to see as a result of the congestion uh, pricing. Mm. So that kind of begs the question about this AI technology. Uh, how can it help the situation? Because uh, this is a, something that I consider to be a problem with so many larger vehicles on the road, not only heavier vehicles with the advent of electric vehicles being much heavier, yeah. but also the width of vehicles with SUVs being so popular. A lot of times you can't even drive down a suburban street when cars are both par cars are parked on both sides of the street because the opposing driver is kind of afraid they'll they'll clip mirrors or something. So can AI help in that sense? 
You know, it really can, and it does today. I mean, our technology is deployed across the nation. Um, so we see this every single day where traffic management centers who are responsible for managing roadways and congestion and, and finding, you know, when an incident happens, how do I remove that so we can get traffic going again? They're in a difficult position. They're leveraging old technology. Um, and many times they're looking at screens of, of cameras, their live video feeds. Um, and it takes a human being able to watch a hundred screens to try to find out if something happened. And if something does, what do we do about it? And we try to reroute it, call the, the right agency. Maybe I need a, a tow truck to come out and move a car. Maybe I need a, a, an FSP driver, a freeway service provider to go drag a deer off the highway, you know, crazy things like that. Or maybe it's a 12 car pileup, God forbid. But those things happen every single day and they happen everywhere. And so your ability to know what's happening is really critical. What AI can do and does is be able to really take in a lot of information and find the needle in the haystack and say, look, there's your problem. So it doesn't require someone to do, sit there and monitor 100 screens to try to figure out what happened. It'll tell you, there's your problem. Here's what you can do about it. And so the AI element of it is not some scary thing. It's really about situational awareness. Um, it's about you know, understanding, not uncovering. It's about you know, seeing and not voyeurism kind of idea, right? So yes, it does help and it's already working today. Really fascinating stuff. So David, then what, you know, we, we've, we've talked about how our infrastructure was really designed at the, you know, the start of automobiles and, uh, you know, really has not changed much since, you know, those early days. What does, what comes next when it comes to, the, you know, we've got smart roadways, smart cars now that could potentially drive themselves, which kind of blows my mind a little bit. But, you know, how do we begin as a society and as a community to start integrating this technology? Yeah, it's a very good question, Kara. And it's a, it's a common question. What do you do? Well, concrete, steel and asphalt, they're not going to change. Um, we, we need them. We ride on them. <laughs> uh, so that's not going to change. What's going to change is today about a there's about a thousand or more sensors on a vehicle today, and, and they're infinitely smart. They're rolling data centers. They're they're rolling intelligence machines, and they're rolling on infrastructure that is, I would say, dumb. And so the connecting the dots and leveling the playing field has to happen. How do you do that? There's no one sensor on a roadway that's going to solve everything. What's going to happen is that as cars are getting smarter, they become a connected vehicle. A connected vehicle uh, can connect to infrastructure. And it's something that you're hearing more and more in, in the circles of transportation as E2X or vehicle to anything, connectivity. And the interaction, the speeds, the feeds, understanding if, uh, if there's been a, a, a car wreck or a hard braking or weather related activities, it all can be actually understood through the lens of a connected vehicle and enough connected vehicles out there, you have a pretty good understanding of everything that's moving there. But it's not just that. It's connected vehicles, it's, it's, uh, it's Waze data or any of those crowd navigation um, systems that people have on their mobile phones that they use all the time. So it's your mobile data, how fast it's moving. If, you're, if your mobile phone's traveling at 60 miles an hour, you're probably not walking, right? <laughs> so you're able to get a good density uh, picture of what's happening on roadways. And when something stops, you can move, you can, you can react to it and you can, you can address the situation to get it moving again. So it's really a digital layer over top of the concrete asphalt and steel that's there. It's not a rip up and replace. You can't afford to do that. That's crazy expensive. It would create more havoc as you were doing that. So digital layer over top is the key and that's what Recore does. That's what we do to support our states. Fascinating stuff. David, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We really appreciate your time, your insight, your information. Um, very cool. Looking, you know, looking forward and, and how we're how we're going to commute, how we're going to navigate amongst ourselves, amongst our roadways and uh, and with this congestion pricing pricing. So we appreciate your time this morning. Thank you. Yeah, good to be with you. Thanks so much. You know, Mike, I just I, I think that congestion pricing thing, especially now post pandemic, when so many people get to work from home, I think that's going to blow up mm. in a lot of New York business faces because they're going to have a lot of people saying, oh, I'm not I'm going to work from home today. I'm just not coming in. June will be a very interesting month when that yes, goes into it will. Yes, it will. Yeah, that, that'll, be, that'll be wild. So up next, why some lawmakers in Trenton want to limit the public's access to police body cam video. And why a group of Parkinson's patients were invited to Yankee Stadium.
Welcome back to the New Jersey Morning Show. I'm Cara DeFalco along with Mike Favetta. And Mike, there's a new bill in Trenton that could restrict police departments from sharing body cam footage with the public. Joining us now to talk about it is Sophie Nieto Munoz, a reporter from the New Jersey Monitor. Good morning, Sophie. Thanks for joining us. Hi, thanks so much for having me on. Sophie, you wrote an article for the New Jersey Monitor about this. Can you read it at NewJerseyMonitor.com? And oh, you excuse me, you can read it at NewJerseyMonitor.com. What sparked a bill like this to be written? Sure. So this bill, basically what it does is it would prohibit sharing body cam footage obtained through public records requests. So the sponsor said that one of the big reasons for this bill is that there has been what they say is an uptick in YouTube videos, TikTok channels, and other social media sites posting interactions of young women and law enforcement, you know, young women being arrested for DUI, just interacting with police. Um, so they say that this bill aims to stop that. But of course, there are a lot of transparency concerns over how broad this bill is and the impacts that it would have beyond just, um, you know, protecting those specific videos from getting out. Yeah, it does sound kind of, uh, you know, like it opposes the original reason why we did this. So as we dig in a little bit deeper, what would be the opposition, uh, you know, additional opposition to restricting that body cam footage? If I recall uh, when this became a policy that, you know, all officers would wear it and that it would be available to the public, uh, there was a very good reason for that. Right, of course. So this, of course, wouldn't stop the capturing of that footage and you could still obtain it. So you could still get it through a public rec records request. You just can't share it. So mm -hmm. that would mean you can't post it on YouTube, but that would also mean that the press wouldn't be able to request a, uh, let's say, police brutality footage and post that. Uh, lawyers wouldn't be able to request footage and use it during court. The only way you would do it, be able to do that is if you have written consent of everybody in the video, which the question also comes to who does that responsibility fall to? Is it the cops who have to reach out to those people, the clerks who are fulfilling the request? So there's that whole issue. And then just transparency in general, you know, this comes on the heels of a huge effort to overhaul OPRA, which is the state's public records law. So this kind of goes into more of those transparency concerns and whether lawmakers are trying to restrict what the public can see and, you know, what are those reasons behind it? What are they, um, you know, is it really a problem? And I think this brings up a question of precedent. Do you think a bill like this could set a precedent that maybe impacts the public's access to information for other things from the government? Oh yeah, of course. Um, I think that this could be just kind of a small step to seeing how far that they can push the states, how people respond to the state's records request. Uh, last month, like I said, there was this big push to renew Oprah or re-ramp Oprah and we saw a lot of members from the public come out and speak out against it in a way that I haven't seen on any other bill and you know, public records requests. It's a really administrative topic. It's not something that gets people, it's not something that gets people going, you know? So I think that this would, this could potentially be like a piecemeal approach of seeing what those statutes or aspects of Oprah they could start to push through. Now, this wasn't in the original Oprah bill, but there's a lot of conversations around transparency right now, and it seems really convenient that they're both being introduced and discussed at the same time. Interesting stuff, Sophie. So what is next for this bill? I mean, does it have legs in Trenton? Is this something we're really looking at, or is it just kind of something we're talking about, but it might not really get much further than that? I mean, who's to say what happens in Trenton, <laughs> right? Um, it's not up for it. So it still needs to go to committee before it goes for a full vote. It has not been scheduled for committee in either the assembly or the Senate. Uh, what I think is interesting, though, is the two Senate sponsors are Senator Tony Bucco and Senator Brian Stack, both people who are pretty powerful in Trenton. Um, you know, their bills go on pretty uh, their names go on pretty important bills. So it really is to be seen whether this bill moves forward. And I think a lot of it also depends on what happens with the broader Oprah bill and how they move forward with that.
Sophie Nieto Munoz from New Jersey Monitor. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, guys. Have a good one. You too. You know, it's so interesting, Mike, and I, I, we've talked about this a lot on this show where, you know, it. I almost wonder if the approach is, you know, because it sounds like she's saying, well, the average person should not be able to access those videos and then post them on social media as a form of entertainment or even, mm. a, you know, but it does impact journalism. It impacts, you know, legal things. And it, it almost makes me wonder if, and I think society as a whole would benefit from this, there might be some way to register journalists and true journalistic enterprises and, you know, be able to say, well, okay, well, these people who meet these criteria and get this, yeah. you know, the blue check mark, if you will, uh, are right. allowed to do this. And if you don't have that, you can't just do it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And the state police already have a registration like that for media. So, you know, there's already the avenues in place in to order to, to take advantage of it. Yeah. yeah, it'd be interesting. It'd be interesting. Well, Mike, it has been a heck of a week here in New Jersey. So we, we had an earthquake. We've had some flooding. We had a solar eclipse. Uh, what about a meteor? <laughs> now, let's just add to it. There have been reports from folks in South Jersey and Pennsylvania that they saw what they believe was a meteor, and it happened just before 4 a.m. on Wednesday, and some got a glimpse from Margate near Atlantic, uh, Atlantic City. The American Meteor Society shows several reports of this sighting, uh, and there have been a number of videos and images of it on, on social media. You and I were looking it up earlier. I, it, there's something happened. There's something to see there for sure. There is. Uh, now with everybody having the doorbell cameras, you can see kind of every vantage point and every view. And that's helpful for the American Meteor Society to kind of pinpoint of where it occurred. Uh, usually with all of that information, they develop a map. And that map would show the streak across the sky of where the uh, the meteor happened. It didn't sound like there was the shock that you'd kind of typically hear with fireworks that happened this time, which means it was very, very high in the sky or, or maybe too small. But a lot of times, these meteors that come through the atmosphere, they're the size of a fleck of paint. Mm. I mean, that's how small it is. But because they're traveling at 25,000 miles an hour, they burn up and they cause that bright streak in the sky. So some really unique sights across the Northeast. It's, it, it's been a week in New Jersey. It definitely has. All right. Well, something a little sweet here. Studies show that singing can help maintain strength in the muscles of speech and voice in people with Parkinson's disease. So what better way to keep those vocal cords warm than by singing the national anthem at Yankee Stadium as a group of special Parkinson's patients recently got to do. Let's take a listen. Direct your attention to the microphones behind home plate. Our guests are a choir of people with Parkinson's disease and Parkinson Plus syndromes who meet weekly to rehearse songs to exercise their speech muscles. So please welcome the Parkinsons. They will now sing our national anthem. Wow, the uh, the Parkins sings, Kara. Really awesome. So joining us now to talk about this momentous occasion is Janice Dibley, manager of acute and inpatient rehabilitation speech pathology at Hackensack Meridian JFK Johnson Rehabilitation Institute and director of the Parkins Sings Choir and Parkinson's patient Donna Mastropolo. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank so you. Much Thank for you for having, having us. So Janice, as the director of the Parkinson's Sings Choir, can you share with us the journey that led up to the choir's performance at Yankee Stadium? Sure. Um, in 2019, we received a community grant from the Parkinson's Foundation in order to establish a community program that might support PD patients. And as speech pathologists, of course, we're concerned with voice and swallowing and speech intelligibility. 
This is a program that allows our choir members to maintain the skills they've achieved here at JFK JRI in speech. Um, we have a multidisciplinary program with PTOT speech and many other services, but this allows them to maintain this. Um, with Parkinson's disease, people are often afflicted with a very low vocal volume. So this encourages good intelligibility, better communication and um, exercise. And we all know that with exercise, we can um, delay effects of Parkinson's. Wow, so Donna, as a Parkinson's patient and member of the choir, how did it feel to perform at such an iconic venue like Yankee Stadium? Words can't describe it. It was. Um, it was amazing. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, just chills, and I just listening to it, I, I still get chills. I mean, it was it was just fantastic. And being a Yankee fan to stand on that field and sing that song, there's nothing in the world like it. Well, you guys did an incredible job. Uh, it was definitely something to hear. I was very impressed. Janice, how did the collaboration between the Rehabilitation Institute and the Parkinson's Foundation contribute to the success of the event? Well, we, we want to get the word out there um, to, to our country, to our state, out there to people for awareness. This is Parkinson's Awareness Month. Today is actually Parkinson's Day. Mm. And for a lot of reasons, awareness to disabilities, but also career opportunities. And most importantly, for these people to live well with this and understand that coming out and participating and establishing the camaraderie and support that they gain from each other is so critical in their journey. Um, this was exhilarating for them. And the Yankees could not have been kinder to us in this experience. So um, it just goes to show that there really is such wonderful support out there in the community. And, and that's our goal. Now, Donna, can you describe how this singing has had an impact on your Parkinson's journey, you know, physically, emotionally? Describe that for us. Well, it's helped my voice tremendously. Um, I do have days where it's still a little you know, funky, but for the most part, um, it's helped tremendously with that. And it's also helped with my confidence. I would never have thought that I would be able to stand up in Yankee Stadium and, and sing the national anthem in front of, you know, 30, 40,000 people. But the confidence it has given me, the camaraderie we have built within the group, we support each other and we've become a family. And that helps tremendously as well. I think in any challenge, having that sense of community is really the, the thing that helps most people. Uh, Janice, as you look back on this performance, what do you hope it accomplishes in terms of, of A, raising awareness about Parkinson's disease and then the importance of music therapy? Right. I, I hope that people, um, oftentimes with Parkinson's, people are very, very focused on the physical tremor. And obviously walking is very important and self-care, but there's not always an awareness of the communication aspect and how that can be improved through speech pathology services. So I think that this increases awareness and I think that it encourages people who would not describe themselves as singers to come out and join something like this um, to be able to sustain and maintain function. Mm. Janice, just briefly before we let you go, is there a website? If there's, how how can people sign up to be a part of the choir? If this is something that you know they've got a recent diagnosis or or what have you, uh, how do we get? How do they get involved? Yes, we are at Johnson JFK Johnson Rehab Institute. We're part of the Hackensack Meridian Health System. We do have a website. It will bring you directly into the Parkinson's section. It's it's kind of categorized by disease process, and um, our choir is free. We meet weekly, um, both virtually and in person, depending, because we went all through COVID. We started this in 2019, and so it was virtual for a while. And we've done so many performances in the past year out in the community at different levels of students. We're trying to educate people, but our website is readily available. Amazing. Janice and Donna, thank you so much for your time this morning. Donna, you, got, you did an amazing performance. Thank you both again. We hope you have a great weekend.
Thank you Thank very you much. Thank you for having us. You know, Mike, what a thing to see. And I, I have to tell you, my, my grandmother had Parkinson's and I do remember her her voice getting very low. Mm -hmm. She became difficult to hear. And then obviously eating became a, an issue. And, and um, you know, what a wonderful way. There's so much uh, that singing actually helps with that we don't even really yeah. fully understand. So what a beautiful way. Um, and how to patriotic. Right? So, so pleasant. Yeah, that was nice to hear first thing on a Thursday morning. Well, Kara, you're watching the New Jersey Morning Show. You can stream us live and watch the replay of our live show anytime on NewJersey.com.